Namaste, Rob. Thank you so much for allowing the Namaste. Calm Mind series to interview you. We really appreciate your time. We know how busy you are, especially during these extraordinary times of great need and what seems to be uh, evolving into a global revolution of sorts. So thank you once again. Uh, for those of you who are watching and are not familiar with Rob's work, uh, before we get into things, I'd like to say we deeply admire the work that you do, uh, tirelessly providing for the Go and Children's education uh, and their families' needs uh, with your charity Go Outreach. So it certainly takes someone with consistency, patience, compassion, determination, and kindness amongst all other, many other positive qualities um, to do this work year in, year out. Uh, and it's something to be celebrated in a world which needs so much of this. So yeah, even more in these testing times we find ourselves in. So without further ado, we'll get into things. So can you please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your childhood, any inspiring role models you had in your younger years of life? Okay, uh, well, my name's Robert. Uh, originally from the UK, but I've lived in Goa now for 15 years. Uh, my childhood was um, from a very small village. We had around 50 houses in our village. And that was, um, my life until I came to India, really. Um, so uh, went to a small village primary school and then on to a, a slightly bigger, but still in a village, comprehensive. And yeah, it was small and um, community orientated. Uh, and then when, when I reached around 14, um, I started doing sort of volunteer work although it was um something i liked to do um and it was just helping at a local um roller skating rink actually and so i used to go and help out um steward and look after everyone make sure they weren't having accidents or being stupid and um, that sort of thing so i did that uh, for around six seven years and then um uh, I, I i did college and went to university um, and then one of my uh, female friends um, wanted to do some volunteer work um, so that's how we ended up in Goa and uh, so I joined her but in the beginning um, because we were from such a small locality um, uh, there wasn't anyone else my own age in my village um, so it was a lot of just wandering around and um, with nature and going in the Becks, the little streams, and um, um, yeah, just that rural type life. Um, and my mum, I guess, is excuse me one second. Um, my mum, I guess, is the uh, main character in my life because my, my father died when I was seven, and my brother died when I was nine, and my granddad when I was 11. So uh, my whole family was female, and my mother was strong and um, she worked um, to help myself and my older sister um and she's still going strong and she comes out here she was out here in uh october november time and now she's mm, 86 or something like that and she's still going strong wow. so yeah. she's um the main influencer of my younger childhood and still now i guess Amazing. so um i i came to go around 16 years ago with my then uh, female friend and it was her idea originally to start a, uh, a charity um, so we started that together in 2004 I think it was and I did that for uh, from 2004 up until 2011 and that charity then got passed over to Indian staff to continue and that's still going um, and then I had a break for a uh, a year and a half I think it was and then the children came to me again and asking for help uh, so I started helping just a few and then a few more and then a few more and then 50 75 100 125 150 so for the last two or three three, yeah, three years four years we've had around 150 children that we've been helping so that's brought me to here yeah wow yes i mean i can imagine that uh word spreads quite fast <laughs> in india yeah. when when you're being helped out you know some people would no doubt be quite desperate so everyone's in, in need in certain areas especially mm -hmm. so no surprise that your numbers grew so quickly there <laughs> 
Amazing. Okay, so I think we've heard now, yeah, about um, how you started the charity and, and sort of what inspired it. So, is the so that, that was my first charity, by the oh, way. So Go Outreach, Go Outreach. I basically started two years after that. So it was about 2013. I started helping a few and then a few more. So from 2013, and then it was registered here in 2016. Okay, nice. So are there some things that you know? now that you wish you knew at the beginning of the journey of service in Goa that would have made things easier? Um, um, just um, I can't think. <laughs> so uh, it's it's difficult so there's always a pushback. Originally when I started and I was helping the kids, uh, the, the original pushback was um, people who didn't know me were saying, oh, why are you coming over here and um, uh, converting our children into Christianity? By the way, I'm an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's their first mentality. Oh, there's a white, the white person and the helping these kids there must be something uh, else involved but no uh, I'm an atheist um, so that, that there's that um, lack of knowledge on their part and it's also a little now it's not but when we first started there was always the thought what are we getting out of it um, uh, still now a little bit they, they think that um, we must be getting a benefit for doing the work that we do. Um, so either financial or whatever it may be, that they think that nobody would do it just to help out. Um, but because um, I've been doing it for so long now, obviously I've helped children going into school and now they've left school at 12th standard. Um, so I've known them a long time. So mo most of the families now know that um what i do and why i do it and, um but it is the the thoughts what they don't know and they they think the worst I yeah think. suspicion suspicion yes yeah yeah <laughs> okay so then on the back of that what would your advice be to someone who was planning to start their own charity for a cause that they believed in and perhaps <clears throat> in a foreign country as well <laughs> yeah so I had lots of people um, ask me the same question because um, they were wanting to do something. And uh, while I was with my first charity, I always said to them, don't do it. Just don't do it. <laughs> it's not worth the hassle. <laughs> um, and then I ended up doing it again. So I didn't listen to myself, but um, it's hard work. You've got to, you can't just do it part-time. You've got to do it full-time, full-on. And it's all day, every day. Um, my previous charity, it was seven days a week, 11 hours every day. Um, and then occasionally you'd get children ringing you at midnight or whatever time and say, oh no, I've just um, spilled hot boiling water down the front, I need to go to hospital or I'm stuck somewhere, can you come and pick me up? That sort of thing. Um, so it's all day, every day. In, with the work that I do. We're a very small team. Um, so currently we just have the three staff, myself and two others, um, for 150 children. Um, so it is full on. Um, and you need to obviously be able to look after yourself financially. Um, so you have to have some savings. Uh, although India is very cheap to live, um, which, which is a benefit. Um, but you need to be able to support yourself and have the time and energy um, to do it. And it takes a lot of both. <laughs> I have no doubt. <laughs> so then when did India first come into your life? I mean, you touched on that. And what was your impression after traveling for the first time? Yeah. So in, in my early 20s, um, I, I started traveling a few places. Um, so I went to Cuba, I went to Kenya, and I went to Goa, and 
so uh, again with uh, my female friend um, and she she was a teacher and um, it was more her idea to do the whole charity thing and uh, I was just coming along to help her out type of thing uh, so it we touched on Goa and we touched on Kenya mainly and we, we chose Goa because it was a lot safer than Kenya uh, don't know if you've ever been to Kenya but they they stand outside cash machines with automatic machine guns. Um, and I think, yeah, okay, Goa sounds better. Um, and so I, I just came on a two week holiday. So it, it was only a, an idea of what, what was here and it was, it was nice. And we went to the local town and um, I, I, I feel comfortable with the simplicity of life. Um, Again, because I had a rural upbringing, I don't need big cities or anything like that. I just like the, the simple things. So, and I find not being derogatory in any way that Goa is just uh, simplistic. It's simple and easygoing and that sort of life. And that appeals to me. Nice. And it kept you coming back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can and the, the weather's not bad either. Yes, this is true. It does have a very long summery season. So yeah. although now it's coming, it's monsoon now, isn't it? It's monsoon now, yeah. Yeah. So, but it's a nice sunny day today, so it's good. Oh, very good. But the humidity levels are a little up there, though. Yeah, no doubt. Um, compassion, as the Dalai Lama states, is the supreme emotion. And really, it is the center of charity work of any kind. Um, you have to have a strong and consistent drive and desire to help others. What drives you to keep doing this work and what gets you up every morning and keeps you here year after year? Uh, well, I can't stop now, they're all relying on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, a lot of it is that, um, but um it is enjoyable uh the children because uh, i've just been down this morning down to give out some textbooks for the 10 standard um so they're like 15 16 year olds they have um the end of the secondary school they have 10 standards so we've been giving out textbooks and you, you're driving along and the children go hello rob hello rob and that that warms the heart um so that that's that's always a driver and it's always nice when some of the older children who's finished now come back and say, you know, it was the best times when you were helping us at the charity, either this one or the old one. And it's just the, we've uh, touched in their lives and it's something that they'll remember. So one of our sayings was uh, give the children a childhood worth remembering. And that is, um, what I want to do and uh, and it's working so far <laughs> so uh, it is that's what drives me their um, acceptance of, acceptance of me and their desire to be part of the work that I do because we, we get so many uh, people requesting um, probably 300 400 every year but we we can't at the moment do more than 150 it's just too much hard work um, and obviously you need extra funds for extra children. Um, so uh, it's just, yeah, people wanting to be part of the work that I do because friends, family or whatever pass the information on. And it's, it's nice. Awesome. So what does a regular day look like for you then? Um, usually, um, it, I'll do it on a year basis. So yearly we get ready for the new school year which we're still doing um although it should have started by now uh so we sort out bags books uniforms stationery school fees umbrellas everything they need to go to school so that's normally from like april may june and they start back in june usually when there's not uh, a pandemic and then um through the monsoon it's just preparing um extra books or study time for them, that sort of thing. And then we get to around October when it's Diwali time. So we also stitch Diwali bags. So we stitch 150 bags out of donated material. So either um, jeans that are too big for the children, we cut them up and make bags out of them. 
um, or shirts and um, bed linen, that sort of thing. So we um, make that sort of thing and then fill it with dry goods and give that out at Diwali. Then the next big thing is Christmas and all the children get to choose what presents they want for Christmas. So we give a lot, a lot of them a, a, an amount for around um, your American. So seven and a half dollars roughly for a, a um, you are American, aren't you? I'm from New yes. Zealand. <laughs> oh, damn! You're still dollars. <laughs> yes, yes. Dollars in New Zealand? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> right. um, I have no idea what the exchange rate is in New Zealand dollars, though. Um, so, about seven and a half US dollars. So mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Um, and then they can choose whatever they want. So, all the children get to um, choose from items that we already have and we associate a price to it. Or they can buy something off Amazon or the local market. Uh, up to a value of around seven and a half US dollars. Um, and then after that is exams time. Um, and then it all starts again. So that's the yearly cycle and that's every year. On a daily cycle, um, in the morning, we just do all the boring stuff, which is preparing, um, cutting material, making the bags, sorting out school items, um, all the office type boring stuff that's not related to the children because all the children that we help go to proper schools um so they go to around 29 different schools um so that means making um 29 different sets of uniforms um all the schools have different material and they all need to be tailored so we have to take the measurements and it's quite a big job um so all of that sort of thing is done in the morning and then um we cook food for the children a subset of them so the ones who come direct from school um, we provide a meal um, and then in the afternoon we take uh, tuition classes for uh, between 15 and 25 children every day so whoever needs the help comes season um, we have a, a set that's here every day um, but quite a few that just come in like once a week or once a month type of thing when they need something, either they need new books or they need help with the subject or they need to search for something online, that sort of thing. Um, and then they go home around six o'clock. Um, and then, but that's seven days a week again. Mm. They never let me have a day off. <laughs> I asked them, oh, so can I have a day off on Sunday? No, we're coming, we're coming, Robert. <laughs> um, so I never get a day off. I think, in, uh, in the last year, oh no, the last eight months, um, I've had two days, three days off, three days off. So wow. it's full on. That is quite amazing. <laughs> quite amazing. Uh, what, what are some of the most common issues that you see children facing in Goa? Um, uh, physical abuse um, and the acceptance of it. Um, when, when you talk to a child, yeah, someone beat me. Uh, oh, it was okay, I was being naughty type of thing. So it's their acceptance that it is an okay thing to do. Um, also, um, the position of the girls in society, uh, especially from um, the Muslim families, uh, they do seem to have it uh, worse off that uh, they don't really have a choice in life they have to do what their family or their um parents say and they don't they just don't have a choice they have to do that um which because my whole family is female um i i've always thought that um they're powerful figures in my family so they should have a voice they should um be able to do what they want when they want how they want type of thing so i i do find it difficult um with the the girls and also some of the the parents also the mothers um also have it quite hard but that that's over uh, all religions also not just the muslims um uh, but it is more acute with the muslim families sadly mm. and that also extends to when the children get to 13 14 years of age and um they mature again the the first worry is ah, they're going to be talking with boys we've got to take them out of school because they might talk with boys um that is a regular occurrence unfortunately and so they just get packed off to the village and 
uh, or married off. So um, young child marriages also, uh, when they're around 14 years old, 15 years old, um, which is also very sad. But they, they just get sent off to villages. I've tried to intervene quite a few times. So um, with my previous charity, um, one of the mothers married her daughter off at 13 years old um, and went to a village somewhere, I don't know where. And thankfully at that time, the mother was unhappy with how the in-laws were treating her. Um, so the mother actually asked for my help to go and get her from this family and bring her back. So we went and went to this village, never been to before, and uh, brought this girl back, even though there was, a, there was a little scuffle and we ended up in the police station. Um, and so the police were obviously local to the family and more on their side and saying, no, no, you should leave her here. Um, you'll have to wait till the courts open on Monday morning and um, all of this. Um, but you have to um, try your hardest and uh, not break in or give in to the intimidation. And in the end, we brought her back, even though they were going to charge her for kidnapping, even though we had the mother with us, the brother with us of the daughter, and she was underage. So it's still 18 years old for marriage in India. Um, so she was 15 at that time. Um, so we ended up bringing her back, thankfully. But I, I think she's been married two more times since then. But uh, She's now older, uh, so it's her choice. Um, but another girl ran away from her in-laws and just ended up on my doorstep one day. And uh, she didn't speak much English and I, I don't speak much Hindi. Uh, so I asked one of the staff to come and basically they weren't treating her very well. So we went to the police station. Um, the mother came and she wrote an affidavit that she'll allow her to go back to school and she wouldn't, she would keep her here for studies. But then I think either that night or the night after, they bundled her into a van and then took her back off to the village and I haven't seen her since. Um, so that sort of thing is frustrating because um, it's the whole, oh, it's the parents know best normally. That, that's, yeah. India hasn't quite gone that step further when they think more about the child and the society. I think that's the problem society rules here yes indeed so um, going into the caste system then um, how would you describe that to someone who knew nothing of it and do you still see it being very active uh, in Goa now um yes um I don't want to alienate any Goans here but Goans see themselves as um, superior. Oh God, please don't throw this in Goa. Um, <laughs> uh, they don't like outsiders. Um, that's not really caste, that's just they're not going. Um, so even as a foreigner, uh, I, I see that. Um, and I've lived here 15 years, but I'll never be going. And I think you have to be, if you're going, you have to be here for like three generations or something silly like that to be classed as going. Okay. Um, but it's so the families from the lower caste they don't get the same opportunities they have a lot of um it's like racism against them or casteism whatever you want to call it it's like race. they're treated differently because of where they come from um and they're often treated when if they're working at a place they're treated with i'd say similarly to a, a slave um because they they don't have the care for them they don't think they're, they're equal to them they they're just there to do the job and if they don't do it we'll find someone else who's cheaper or and there's no care given to them um, that really, and it, it's apparent all the time. Okay. Answer it. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So over the course of your time spent in India, do you see that life has improved in any way for those that you just spoke of, those living below the poverty line? Has there been any significant changes um, with any, say, different governments coming in and going during their term in office? Have you seen a big change at all? Um, the underlying things, no. Um, but in Goa, thankfully, there is... Um, some of them are doing better because there is... Um, a greater chance to get a good income here um, like the fish sellers and things like that they, they do make quite a good income and then uh, the locals don't particularly want to do that because it, it's smelly and dirty and um, so that does give chance to um, families from Connecticut or wherever to come in and do that so there is the opportunity to do it you obviously have to put the work in to do that um, and but I don't think that's really anything to do with the government. Um, there was free, ed uh, sorry, free healthcare, but that seems to be um, non-existent anymore uh, in Goa. Um, you used to pay like um, 10 rupees um, uh, to get a form and then that was it. You could go to the hospital with the same form and uh, get free um be seen for free and get free medication from the hospital but now it's now 100 rupees and that i think you have to pay that every time and if you need an operation then you have to pay as much as you would in a private hospital so that has gotten worse in my opinion um i think goans are allowed to avail that um with um, reduced costs but um most of the families that we help are obviously from out of state and they don't have any going um, credentials. Um, with education, uh, it's, there's a right to education act, um, but the onus was put on the parents. So um, if the parents wanted them to go to school, then the schools should take them rather than um, children should go to school full stop. It was that the parents should send them to school if the parents wanted to and then the schools should accept them um but it, the, it's not that the children have to go to school um it's just if the parents want them to go to school now which the uneducated ones often don't see the need for it so then again go is much better um and literacy is up and go uh, but it, under the current government uh, it might be all down to finances um, but it doesn't seem to be as beneficial for the families now um, things when when they come in to start with it all sounds good but then it, it tapers off um, that's just my view mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that happens with um, politics and policy yes. and <laughs> politicians in general, <laughs> from what I understand as well. So, yeah, it's a, a global a global issue there by the sounds of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so on to another global issue. Uh, with the ever-changing restrictions imposed by COVID-19, uh, we understand that your workload has increased. Uh, how are you managing in these times and are you getting any extra assistance? Uh, so when the lock, because in India the lockdown was um, happened within a few hours, um, so one day it was it was all fine, and then it was locked down, and then it was extended, and then it was extended, then it was the national one. Um, so a lot of families were struggling at that time because um, most of the families that we help are daily wages, and if they don't go out to work, they don't have any food for the evening. Um, so we did start off by helping out the families that we helped already so there's about different families that we helped so we provided rations for them and then um we started they told their neighbors because they were also struggling and then their neighbors told other people and then that mushroomed so we were getting through a lot of rations um and thankfully 
halfway through we managed to borrow a car because otherwise we were carrying all these rations on a motorbike 60 kilos of uh, potatoes on the front for another 50 kilos on the back wow. on this motorbike and that was just the potatoes and onions then there was rice and dal and flour and they all come in huge 50 kg sacks um so that that was difficult but fun and i lost five kgs in weight which was a bonus um and it was very busy and we were giving out to hundreds of people um thankfully now it's a lot better and it's near enough back to normal we still um we were very very lucky to get uh, donations off coca-cola and also um nestle um so coca-cola gave bottles of drinks and little um cartons and Nestle gave us Kit Kats and Polos and Maggie noodles like um, instant type noodles and um, lots of things so uh, we've just about given those out now there's one box I think left um, so there's probably two thousand pounds worth um, again I don't know how to relate that to New Zealand dollars That's okay. um, <laughs> so two and a half three thousand yeah two and a half thousand US dollars uh, roughly worth of goods that we gave out um, just from the donated ones um, but now things are back to normal people are out and about um, all the shops most of the shops are open and most people are returned to work I've had a couple of calls this morning about rations um, but we've we stopped giving those out now because um, the monsoon is um, we're back to having just a motorbike again and you can't really buy dry goods in the monsoon and expect for them to stay dry uh, and give them out at the same time. Absolutely. So. <laughs> it's a soggy time but, yeah, for everyone. Think, think, things are back to normal, but schools haven't started yet. So we're all delayed in the school year. So expecting those to start in August, I think. Um, um, but other than that, things are mostly back to normal. Okay. Well, that's positive news. I think uh, many places in the world are slowly creeping and back to normal, but mm. still a lot of changes. And, and so will there be a, a new normal, uh, do you think, or relatively similar operating model? Uh, so ev everyone's wearing masks um, uh, when they go out. And because Goa was um, in a good position for a good month where we only had seven cases, um, but now we're up to 700 mm. in, in the last month. We've gone up that much, up to around 700 now. Uh, so, and yesterday was the closest one. It's maybe two and a half, you know, maybe two kilometers away from us, um, a positive case, which is the closest it's been and it's it's worrying and i don't see because also the problem with india is there's not enough testing going on um the testing rate compared to other countries is minute and without the testing you don't know where you are or where the the um, locality is um so from my perspective they need to do more testing otherwise is, is going to drag on, I think, because you're not going to be able to contain it. And I, I see, I've heard news that the, it might peak in November here, which is still quite a long way away. Um, but I, I don't know what the next year's going to, I'm not expecting any visitors particularly much um, in the coming at least six months. Um, so I don't, I don't know. So it depends how the children go back to school and um, what the outcome of that is, because I assume there's going to be a big jump when the children go back to school, because uh, all the families do live in such confined spaces and uh, it, it's hard to do the whole social distancing thing when you have like 60 children in one class. Um, I, I don't know how it's going to work. Well, we hope for the best, as we do everywhere at the moment. Uh, yeah, certainly really crazy times. I mean, I'm a traveller myself, so it's completely derailed, you know, my 
popping in and out of India plans, but such is life. Um, do you have any rituals, practices, or things that you do to keep yourself calm in the midst of your daily life and the demanding workload? How do you cope with such a demanding workload every single day? Uh, I, I guess I'm used to it. <laughs> uh, I, I, do, I do veg out in the evenings. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, when everyone goes home, um, make myself a coffee. Um, Obviously, I still have to do emails and things. I think I was still working till about 10 o'clock last night, but it's a relaxed atmosphere um, and I can just chill. Um, even better when the AC is actually working, but um, um, it's nice. And then I watch a, a film or a TV episode and then it, then it starts again. But yeah, I, I like the quiet time. Uh, I, I, I don't get stressed particularly easily. Um, but yeah, I do like the quiet. I do like when they go home. <laughs> yes, quiet time for oneself is very important, I think, yes. to keep the, yourself balanced. Um, so do the children have any mindfulness practices in their day, or do Westerners ever come and conduct workshops or classes for them? Because being Goa, there's a lot of tourism there. Yeah. So we do get people popping in and, um, so I do say that if they want to do something, it should be self-contained. If they bring the items and um, I can just um, provide the children, so to speak. Um, so like 10 children and they bring the craft type things. And normally it's like craft work or dance or um, painting, whatever. So if they bring all the items and then it's done and then dusted, um, because we used to get people who wanted to come and, oh, we want to do this and we don't do this. Have you got the things to do it? No. And then we have to run around Mapsa or the local town and buy the things and that's stressful. <laughs> so uh, if, if anyone wants to do something with the children, they should get everything ready so um, they can come do it um, and then go again. Because again, the children just aren't, haven't got the patience. Um, if it doesn't start straight away, they'll they'll go off and um, do something else. Or because um, we got <clears throat> uh, we got tabs here, we have got a little computer, and they they get distracted. So it, it needs to be ready and ready to go type of thing. Um, but the children like dance um, and simple games and yeah, any crafty type things. So a couple of the kids were doing paint with string where they hold it between two pages and pull it type thing yesterday. That, that, that sort of thing, simple, simple things are good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so um, have you seen the role of women in India shift and change throughout your time living and working here? Not so much. <laughs> Uh, uh, in, again, it is better in Goa, so, but there is even the ones who have been brought up in a Western style, they are how I would expect Western ladies to be, but the ones that are from the other states and aren't Goan, um, especially, there is still this backward thinking, if I can say that, about their place in society, that um, they, they should wear, um, oh God, uh, traditional clothes. Um, they shouldn't be talking with boys. They, um, yeah, it's just old fashioned. Um, and clothing especially is always, um, even even if a girl has a boyfriend, the boyfriend's still going to say, oh no, you can't wear this, you can't wear that. Um, you can't go over there. You, the girls still have to um, ask for permission from the boys. Um, that There doesn't seem to be any, any equal status quo at all. It is men rule over here. Mm. Um, which I don't like. 
<laughs> Again, being brought up by women all my life. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough, too. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, <laughs> big, big difference between Western cultures still and some of these mm. Eastern cultures. Mm. And I think a lot of people don't realise, you know, how um, different and how, as you say, old-fashioned, for lack of a better term, yeah. um, things still are in a lot of these countries. Um, there's a long way to go for women still. Uh, so um, Even some of the children that I help, they're still expecting to have an arranged marriage. That They don't... Uh, and... It, it's, it's just part of their culture rather than... And it's hard to get out of that. Because then there's always, oh, again, yeah, that's not our culture. You're going against it. You're going against the family. And there's the whole, oh, what will the people think? There's, it's always about other people's opinion rather than your own. Yes, society rules. <laughs> mm -hmm. What inspires you in work and in life? Um, <sighs> inspires me. Um, I don't know. Uh, just the the children. How the children are always happy. That's one of the good things about working in India. The children are always happy, even if you give them the smallest little thing. They're so grateful. The um, and that inspires me to want to do more. It's. Um, it, yeah, that really. Just how the children are, how um, welcoming the families are. Um, so occasionally the the parents cook me food and then bring me it, and it's just so nice. It it, it feels like a big family. Again, I've I've known most of them for ten, fifteen years or whatever. So um, I I do feel like I'm part of the family, although I'm still treated slightly like a foreigner <laughs> um, but um, when, when I go down anywhere around here I always get hello hello and I, I don't know most of them but they know me and, it, and I, I hope they're saying good things about me I know I, I don't I'm know sure but... they are. <laughs> <laughs> they'll do your hard work so, uh, I they're this the strengths and um, how they can overcome all these, just like at the moment it's uh, the monsoons, there's so many mosquitoes there, um, so I don't know how they manage that. Thankfully where I stay, hardly get any um, but they, they have hundreds and I don't know how they cope with it, so um, just their strength of being able to deal with that sort of thing um, inspires me to help them Nice, it's beautiful. Well, finally, uh, what would your wishes or message be to the listeners of this interview? <laughs> um, come to India, for starters. Um, it's a wonderful country. Um, uh, you either love it or hate it, but you've got to try it out to find which one it is. Uh, and don't stay in a hotel all the time. Uh, go out see places um, and it's a fantastic fantastic country and um, so diverse and raw and um, colorful vibrant um, it's great <laughs> yes I completely um, agree <laughs> it's a wonderful and uh, with a charity um, there are lots of small NGOs doing great work, um, and yeah. Uh, but come and see what they do, and if you like what they do, and then help them out. It's always good. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Rob. Really, really okay. appreciate it. We know uh, what a super busy human you are. Uh, and for anyone watching this video, if you would like to donate to Goa Outreach, you can go to www.goaoutreach.org. 